Good morning. That is not going to be the only opportunity to dance in worship today. So if, if you're thinking about not dancing, get your feet to itching because it's going to be time to dance in a little bit. Our scripture lesson today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Hear these words. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Let's pray. Gracious God, uh, here we hear some words from Paul to, to his protege, to Timothy. God, help us too, as followers of you, to hear these words for us. God, this morning I ask that you would speak through me or in spite of me, that we might hear the clear invitation of Jesus to follow him, to yield our lives to him and everything we are and everything we have. Be, that we would be his disciples. God, bless us in this room. Build us up. Move our feet. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. I want you to think about a time an invitation changed your life. Hopefully a, an invitation for some to change your life in a positive way. Uh, as I think about this, there's a few that come to my own mind. The year was somewhere about 2011, and I was invited to go to a house concert in Fort Wayne, Indiana. There was a, a worship leader from a church up the street that was putting together uh, little house concerts to meet in people's homes and sing some praise songs and some original songs, and I said, well, why not? Um, I don't have anything else going on. I mean... I rarely did, right? Uh, <laughs> so I went, I went to this house concert, and it, it was a good concert. But the thing that uh, impacted my life the most is that there happened to be a wonderful, beautiful, amazing young lady there. Her name was Elena. I didn't find that out until a few months later. And I, was, I had to ask my friends, what was her name? I need to stalk her on Facebook, right? Uh, but in a healthy way. I need to look her up on Facebook, not in like a creepy, destructive way, right? Like she never had to call the police on me or anything like that. Um, but the, the invitation to this little house concert changed the trajectory of my life. And then these invitations, too, to hang out with friends. We had some mutual friends because we only talked for about 10 seconds at that house concert. And luckily for me, she came up and talked to me, and I didn't have to do it the other way around. Uh, but she came up to me, talked to me, and then we met in groups of friends over and over again until I finally got up the courage to, to invite her on a date that she didn't know was a date. But invitations into things can change our lives. Here's another one that changed my life. In college, the year was a few years before 2011, maybe 2004, something like that. And there were two friends that I had. One was my roommate and one was someone else. And they, they weren't followers of Jesus. They didn't really have time for Jesus. Maybe they were a little bit curious a couple, like, about what Jesus was about. But one thing they were doing is that they were going on a mission trip. I was pretty serious about Jesus at the time, but I had never gone on that kind of a mission trip. They were going to travel to Appalachia, and they were going to build some stuff and make people's homes better and safer uh, and give them more dignity, right? And they invited me to go on a mission trip, which, again, was good work, helped me to put my faith into action in a way that was really beneficial for my growth, but also helped me meet someone who would be my mentor for years to follow after that. One more invitation. While I was in college, so we're kind of going backwards in time, and I was thinking about going into ministry. A pastor called me up, and he said, hey, Nick, we want you to preach one of the seven last words of Jesus on Good Friday. Good Friday is the Sunday before, or the Friday before Easter, when we remember Jesus' crucifixion, the death before the resurrection on Easter. And one of the things that churches do sometimes is they get seven preachers together to each talk for 
five minutes or so. Preachers always talk longer than you think they should. Uh, but they talk for about five minutes or so uh, and on each of the last seven statements of Jesus' life as recorded in Scripture. And somebody counted them at one point and said, that's a good number. Let's, let's do that. And so they gave me one of the phrases, and I'm like, okay, this will be fine. I don't have to do a great job. I'm, I'm really nervous. But there's going to be seven of us. There's going to be six other people to bring home the message that day. I just got to show up and, and not get in the way too much. Kind of like playing guitar over here today. I just got to show up and not get in the way too much. But I showed up, and it, I panicked. Because there were six preachers, like pastors, educated, faithful people, and me, like this confused college student that showed up. But still, the invitation continue to set my feet on a path that would lead here today. Invitations can make a big difference in our lives. Sometimes it's to things like faith. It's to go to church with someone for the first time or go to someone's small group for the first time or go serve in a mission trip for the first time. But sometimes it's things like an invitation to go on a first date or an invitation to apply for a job that you've never thought about before but maybe is the place that God is leading you. An invitation to a party where you make new friends that build into your lives in the way that you didn't have those kinds of friends before. Simple invitations can lead us really far in our lives. Today, in our scripture lesson, Paul, the author of much of the New Testament, is writing to his protege, Timothy. Paul is nearing the end of his life, the end of his ministry, and, and just because he is about... Well, eventually he's going to die. Uh, just because his ministry is about over does not mean that God's work and God's ministry is over. So, Tim so Paul writes to Timothy with an invitation of sorts. He makes it a little more forceful. He calls it a charge. I'm going to charge you with this. I'm going to you know, say you really need to do this. This is your purpose. This is your energy. This is the work that, sets, that is set before you. And so Paul starts charging Timothy with this work. Now, we think today sometimes of the church being in turmoil, and we think, oh, in the, in the early church there was no turmoil. That's not true. There, there's turmoil after turmoil after turmoil. There, there was so much turmoil, they had special meetings where all of the bishops had to come, over, come together and vote on who was right and wrong, like on a regular basis. They had things like Gnosticism to combat, where people said, uh, Jesus had some special stuff, some secret stuff that he told his disciples, but they didn't write down. And we know what it is, and you don't. And so we have a secret society. There were people who were like, well, let's just cut out parts of the Bible. Uh, if we just take part of this book and get rid of most of those other books, then it will be fine. And so these, these kind of heresies, these challenges arose time and time and time again. And so when Paul is writing to Timothy not to be discouraged in the face of conflict, there is big conflict going on. And that's at the big scale. There's conflict, littler conflict, little fights in churches going on as well about like, how do you do communion? And can the people who can get off work early and go have communion first, can they drink all the wine so much so that they're drunk by the time everyone else shows up for communion? And Paul's answer was, no. But there was all kinds of fights going on. At the end of this charge, Paul tells Timothy this, but you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Here at, uh, at Asbury, we practice a five-fold leadership on our membership teams. We have a leader, an evangelist, a trainer, a, um, a pastor, and a prophet. And so an evangelist is one of the roles that we have on each of our teams. And I tell you, evangelism sometimes is one of those things that just kind of wigs me out. Because for a long time, I've had the wrong idea of what evangelism is. I got to go to the Indy 500 this year, and as you walk in the main gates, there's somebody with a giant sign, and he has a hymnal. That's not one that I'm familiar with, but he's got some kind of hymnal, and he's singing very poorly at the top of his lungs through every page of the hymnal. It's like, I don't think people are listening to you, man. I don't think people are going to connect with Jesus because of that work right there. But that's what I thought I had to do. Also pictured like the kind of thing where you go into Waffle House, I don't know why Waffle House. I don't really go to Waffle House. Uh, it doesn't, um, I've had some bad experiences, uh, as, as maybe we all have, but some of us love it anyways. Uh, but I picture having to go to Waffle House and sit at the counter and like turn to the person 
sitting next to me, who I always assume is on some kind of business trip, because when else do you go to Waffle House except for if you're on a trip? And, and then I have to be like, okay, I'm a salesperson, and I'm going to convince this stranger sitting right next to me to, to believe in Jesus. And I always pictured like this evangelism has to be this hard sell kind of work. Well, just recently, I worked with the best evangelist that I ever met. She was the office administrator at my last church. And she wasn't like at tent revivals preaching sermons. She wasn't, uh, you know, bringing the fire and the brimstone every day into the office and convicting us all to change. What she did, she invited people. Oh, there's something going on at church? Who do we need to invite to that? Oh, what can our church do that we can invite people from the community into? Oh, this, we're having a meeting. Who do we need to invite onto that team? How can we include more people into that work? Not just strangers sitting at the counter at Waffle House who's just trying to eat their eggs over easy, right? But people who are hungry, not for eggs, but for God. People are hungry for changes in their life. People are just hungry for something to do on a random night in December so they can go to a house concert instead of sitting at home alone. People who need the invitation to that next step. And so this is what I think evangelism really is. Evangelism is the invitation to take that next step that's going to lead us a little bit closer to Jesus. God has this story that's unfolding in the universe. And there's a longing inside of us to be part of that great, big, grand story that is changing and shaping the face of the earth. And so we, as people who are gifted inviters, or maybe not so gifted inviters, invite people into the next experience that's right for them with Jesus. There are people uh, in churches who are like, they're just really good at inviting people. There was a guy in Logansport, and he knew I was a pastor. He was a pastor too, but he was just constantly inviting me to things at his church. Like, well, man, I'm working that night at my church, but but thank you. Just everywhere he went, everything he did, he was inviting people. Not just inviting them, but finding ways to include them in meaningful ways. Some people are just excellent inviters, and they can almost not even help themselves from inviting people into stuff. Not simply to play basketball or go to dinner one time, but into the work of Jesus. And so for each of us, there's a seat. There's a place that we belong. There's a a place for us to sit and to contribute. There's a place for us to sit and grow around the tables of small groups or in worship as we praise God. There's an empty place for us to fill. I'm always waiting for the next invitation in my life. God, where, and hopefully so I don't miss it, right? God, where are you calling me to grow or to serve next? One of the things I want, to, I want to say is don't be afraid to invite yourself once in a while. If God is nudging you, that's the invitation. And if someone else has not invited you yet, don't let that stop you. Uh, when we take communion here, we talk about how it's God's, it's Jesus' invitation to the table. It's not the church's invitation or mine but it's an invitation from God to all of us to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. The invitation's from God. When we're invited to serve or to grow, the invitation comes from God. And so we have people on each team whose their, their job is to know what our passion is and to invite us into the places to serve and grow in, in the next place. I was invited to play guitar today. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be preaching today. I was supposed to be on a mission trip, but you know, sometimes plans fall apart. It's just how it goes. And so, so now I'm preaching too. Uh, but they let me play guitar in the band today. And I'm this good at guitar, but because they invited me to play and then Tyler worked with me this week, I'm this much better at guitar. The invitation that we're waiting on, the invitations that we receive are the 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 path that's going to take us that much closer to God, that much closer to where God is pointing us 
and life. We are to be inviters. Hey, come along with me. We are to respond to invitations. Oh yeah, I'll try that. But always there's a particular invitation that we're working towards, that we're trying to be a part of. And that's Jesus' invitation to follow him. When Jesus walked on the earth and lived out his ministry, he was constantly inviting people. Some of the people he invited, he invited them to follow him. Sometimes he invited himself over to dinner at their house. Like, they weren't ready for that, but he said, hey, I'm going to have dinner with you tonight. Uh, That was a little bit baked into the culture then, too, but he invited himself into relationships with people. He invited people. He asked them, do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed? He constantly invited people. And our invitation, the the grand invitation that over... uh, is the umbrella over of all the little um, invitations that are part of our faith, are to be people who follow Jesus, to be people who pattern our lives after his life, to pattern our lives after his teaching, and to trust in the grace that's available to us that Jesus lived for us, died for us, and rose again and conquered death for us, To to partake and to participate in that grand narrative That in the end, God will win. In the end, God's kingdom is coming here on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe in its fullest fruition in heaven. But we're invited to be not just beneficiaries of Jesus, but partners with Jesus. People who practice and live faith every day. We're going to a wedding in October, I think. We got the save the date card. And I've, I've, booked, I've booked an airplane flight. So uh, sometimes when you get invited to a wedding, uh, you might get a plus one, right? And so bring, bring a date with you. Um, I'm really hoping I'm going to get like a plus three for this wedding because I'm planning on taking my kids with me. Not three dates, uh, but a, a wife and, and two kids, right? So I'm, I'm, ta- uh, I'm really hoping that I get a plus three because if I don't, we're going to have some serious trouble. But when God invites us to the banquet table, We don't just get a plus one. We don't just get a plus three. It's not just plus your family. It's plus infinity. The table expands to fit as many people as we can invite into the story. So we don't stop at inviting one person or three people, but as many as we possibly can. And we invite them into church, and we invite them into the ministries where God is already being introduced to people. Not as expert salesmen, but as people along on the adventure with each person we encounter. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the invitation to follow you. Thank you for the ways that uh, you've gotten through through to us already, inviting us into places uh, to change us in ways that we didn't expect or anticipate. Thank you for the people who say yes to inviting other people. God, help us to be part of that effort meeting people, knowing their desires, and inviting them along on the next step that's right for them. Help us to be people who receive invitations and are constantly measuring and asking, God, is this the place that you are taking me next? And when the time is right, God, help us to say yes in faith as we follow you, not knowing where the road will lead, but knowing that you are with us. Help us to be a place where when people are invited to experience you here, we don't get in the way but we're constantly pointing pointing others to your goodness and your grace. God, do your work. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.